the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever, the Financial Survival Network. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Special guest with us today he hasn't been on the show much recently. Uh, somebody who I've known for over a decade now, hard to believe, I've been doing this on my 12th year now. But Peter Schiff is with us. Peter, uh, hey, great to have you back. And uh, well, the world is uh, getting more complicated by the day. What is your take on what's happening in the world and particularly <laughs> the economies, the global economy? It's kind of an open-ended uh, question that would take a long time to answer. There's certainly a lot of stuff going on in the world. Uh, but I don't think my, my take has really changed uh, over the <clears throat> decade or so that I know, know you. I think, it's, I think it, it goes back further than that. I think I've known you maybe 20 years or more. I'm not really, yeah, really sure. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, financial survival, I think, is the name of the game, although it, it hasn't been too difficult in recent decades to survive. We've, we've had a big bubble. And so the people who have been invested uh, have done well. But I do think that the bubble is going to pop. I think a lot of air is going to come out. And I think there may not be many survivors financially anyway. But I think that I'll be among them. I mean, that's been my my strategy. I think my clients, uh, to the extent that they're following my advice, uh, will 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 end up doing well. But uh, I I've been warning for many many years that the path that we're on, the fiscal path, uh, the money printing, would lead to disaster. And I still believe that that's the case. I think it's even a bigger disaster now than what I was worried about a decade or two ago because all of the imbalances have gotten much worse. Uh, we're far more indebted now as a people, as a nation, than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, two years ago. Uh, you pick the time frame. Uh, the national debt's 31 and a half trillion and rising, and that's just the, the funded portion. The unfunded portion is much larger. We have the largest trade deficits we've ever had, far larger than they were when I first started worrying about them uh, you know, back then. Uh, the economy is, is is far more out of balance and dysfunctional uh, now than it ever was. And uh, we're headed for a much bigger crisis. I mean, we had some, uh, you know, test runs along the way. We had the 2008 financial crisis, kind of a warm up for what's coming. You know, we had uh, what we experienced, uh, you know, with COVID. But um, that was pretty tame stuff, I think, compared to where we're headed when we get the ultimate crisis, which is going to be a U.S. dollar and a sovereign debt crisis. And we're certainly a lot closer to that than we've ever been. Uh, you know, exactly how many days or years we have left, I, I certainly can't guess. But uh, the number is a lot shorter than it used to be. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, the debt clock is ticking away before our very eyes. When you look, you know, I had David Stockman on the show guy who I followed for a long time, I asked him, what is your biggest regret from your Washington days? And you know what he told me? He said that we didn't push for sound money because uh, he was always a sound money. Uh, yeah, the, well, and Reagan was a sound money guy, too. But and the shot. other thing, <laughs> the other thing that they've got to regret is they didn't cut any spending. I mean, they, you know, they, they Ronald Reagan ran a good campaign, at least the first one against Jimmy Carter, you know, getting rid of the Department of Energy, the Department of Education, and those departments hadn't even been around very long. In fact, the Department of Energy was started by Jimmy Carter. So it seems that, you know, back then was the time to get rid of it. But, you know, it's still here. It hasn't produced a barrel of oil, but it's still here. We've spent a lot of money, wasted a lot of money on that department. But, um, you know, they should have cut government spending. They, they did a good job with you know, reforming the tax code and reducing the marginal rates of taxation. I mean, that was a positive, but 
you know, they didn't they didn't cut government. Government kept getting bigger and bigger. And of course, now, I mean, it's, it's growing uh, even faster. Of course, you know, Biden did the State of the Union yesterday and bla- bragged about how he was cutting the deficit. Of course, he didn't cut anything. We have the, the biggest deficits now. I mean, you can't just compare it to that one year that we had COVID, which was complete craziness. Uh, but you compare the Biden deficits to uh, the, the Trump deficits before COVID, uh, and they're much bigger. You know, I thought it was rich that Biden was criticizing Trump for increasing the national debt by 25% in one term, right, which was a quarter of all the, the entire national debt. Well, when he was in office with with Obama during their two terms, they doubled the national debt. <laughs> so, you know, they increased the national debt by more than every single president or about the same rather as every president from George Washington to George Bush. You know, so how you could, you know, you know, the pot the called George. the kettle black in that in that situation. Yeah, uh, but hypocrisy. <laughs> yeah, but look, at least look, he's correct to criticize Trump, but he's not the one to criticize him, you know, because he, he's got blood on his hands. I criticize both of them. I criticize the deficits under uh, under Bush, and then I criticize them under Trump. And so I, I have a right to criticize them, uh, certainly under under Biden, because, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not a hypocrite or I, I don't accept the deficits when they're the Republicans. Uh, but oppose them when it's the Democrats. I oppose them all the time. Um, But I can say objectively that when it comes to deficits, the Democrats are on balance even worse than the Republicans, but they both fail. None of them are any good. (laughs) That's saying a lot. (laughs) Yeah, none of them pass my class in fiscal responsibility. Everybody gets an F. Yeah. Maybe the Democrats just get an F minus. If you can have well enough money. <laughs> <laughs> they earned it. They earned it. They didn't just get it. They actually went out of their way to uh, to get that grade. You know, we see inflation. I don't know about you. We hadn't talked, but in the beginning of the pandemic, I knew the inflation was coming. Well, you start just giving out bushels of money, and then around the world, you shut down production, and then you can't figure out why you can't buy a car. It was coming. What would you do to cash in on that uh, yeah. trend? Well, well, first of all, you know, I've been talking about inflation again for 10, 20 years. I mean, it's been a problem. Uh, we've been in denial of the inflation problem. One of the reasons we've been able to deny it is because we don't measure it accurately. So all the years that the government kept telling us inflation is 2% or lower, it was actually quite a bit higher than that. But we weren't uh, measuring it properly. But it went off the charts in the aftermath of COVID. And I, you know, I'm not a Monday morning quarterback. I remember March of 2020, when the Fed announced this QE infinity program with COVID and we drop rates on my podcasts, and all those podcasts are up there. I mean, I don't edit them. You can go listen to my podcasts from March of 2020 and uh, uh, April and May and all that. And I was saying that this was the worst possible combination of monetary and fiscal policy I'd ever seen, the most inflationary combination of policy, that the correct monetary policy would have been to shrink the money supply because everybody was staying at home and not working. So economic activity was contracting, production was contracting. We needed to contract the money supply along with the good supply. If we didn't do that, you know, prices were going to rise. But we did the worst possible thing. Instead of contracting the money supply along with the economy, we expanded it even faster. We basically told people to stay at home and don't work, don't produce anything, but here's a bunch of money to go out and buy stuff. Buy what? They weren't making anything. Amazon. And in fact, and in fact, we gave a lot of people more money not to work than what they earned when they did work. And of course, when they worked, they were at least productive. When they sat at home, they produced nothing. But they were they were getting paid more to produce nothing than they earned producing something. So I said this was a disaster, that prices were going to skyrocket. And that's exactly what's happened. And we're not nearly done with it. We still have a long way to go on the upside when it comes to uh, prices. And I think what we're experiencing now is just, you know, a, a, a bit of a trough. And so the lull before the next storm. 
this is what's transitory, this decline in inflation, disinflation, which is how Powell described it, this is transitory. I think before the end of the year, we're going to start to be surprised once again, the way the, way the Fed was in 2021, by uh, how strong inflation comes roaring back. Not that it ever went away, but the improvement's going to go away, and we're going to start to see even worse data than what we saw last year. Yeah, and it was dreadful. I mean, look, uh, you're working class, blue collar, you know, the working poor. This inflation is about the worst thing that could ever happen to you. When people, even upper middle class, sit in their ivy towers and say, well, you know, it's declining, things are getting better. Those people, the lower income earners, have already been dramatically damaged. Not to mention, if you've got to feed a family of four uh, on a paycheck, it's really tough out there. And I don't yeah. think uh, that, uh, yeah. you know, the, the more well-off people really understand the damage that these policies have wrought. Well, right. And, and, and of course, when you talk about it, you don't even want to talk about the damage and blame it on inflation and say inflation is causing uh, all this harm among working class people. It's not inflation. It's the government that's doing it because it's the government that's creating the inflation. So it's the government that is harming working class people. And how are they doing that? By paying for government spending through inflation rather than through legitimate taxation. Because all these programs that guys like President Biden like so much cost a lot of money. And nobody wants to raise taxes to pay for the programs. Now, of course, they'd love to raise taxes on the rich. You know, that's easy because there's not that many rich people who vote, I mean, in relationship to everybody else, but the rich are already paying a lot of tax and you know they're not gonna pay much more. So to the extent that you really want all this government, you've gotta make the middle class and the working poor pay for it, but they can't afford it. They can barely afford to support themselves, let alone all these government programs. So what the politicians do is they say, well, we're just going to print money. We're just going to run deficits. And that's how we're going to pay for these programs. And that causes prices to go up. And so when people are struggling to pay the rising cost of food or, or shelter or insurance or everything else, that is the tax. Those higher prices is how they're paying for all these government programs. And so if the cost of paying for those programs is imposing hardship on the public. It's the government's fault. And if the government cared about the people, they would cut spending to relieve the public of the burden of paying for all those programs. Yeah, well, in an ideal world, but the average person doesn't really even understand where inflation comes from. They think inflation is strictly higher prices. Yes, and understand and, and, Milton Friedman. Yeah, and that's not an accident. That is by design. Everybody wants the public to misunderstand inflation. In fact, inflation is probably the most misunderstood term in the English language. You know, it doesn't mean rising prices. It means an expansion of the money supply. Rising prices is just a potential consequence of inflation, but it is not inflation. But the reason that so many people believe that a consequence of inflation is, in fact, inflation is because the government, which creates the inflation, wanted to blame it on other people. And so once you redefine inflation as rising prices, well, then you can blame it on Putin. You can say, well, Putin's the reason that prices are going up. Or you can blame it on greedy businesses that are profiteering and gouging their customers. But when you properly define inflation, then you can't do that. It's obvious who's causing inflation if it's an expansion of the money supply, because it's the government that expands the money supply. It's not corporations. Putin can't expand our money supply. Only we can do that. Uh, so we cause the inflation uh, and, uh, and, and it's not going to go away because we're continuing to cause more inflation. In fact, the president referred again yesterday to the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act is an act to increase inflation. That's what the act does. It spends money that the government doesn't collect in taxes. It's expansionary policy. It is inflationary by design. It is just a lie. You know, president was all upset last night because hotels want to charge 
resort fees. Oh, that's not fair. You know, that's bad marketing. I mean, compare that to what the government does, you know, with, with how they label their legislation. Look, if you don't like resort fees, just don't stay in hotels that charge them. I mean, it's ridiculous. The problem is if you don't like your taxes, you got to pay them. You don't have any choice. Instead of worrying about the $25 resort fee, you know, why don't they worry about the thousands of dollars that families are paying in the income tax and the inflation tax? Do something about that. Forget about airlines and hotels, you know, because that's got the government's, that's none of the government's business. You know, if a hotel wants to charge a resort fee, let them charge a resort fee. You know, it's like, it's a free market. They have, you own the hotel, you can charge whatever you want. You can label the fees however you want to label them. And, and if customers want to pay them, they'll pay them. If not, they'll go someplace else. But, um, you know, the government has no business uh, attacking anybody else for deceptive advertising. Everything they do is deceptive advertising. <laughs> Got it. So true. And you, you just look around and you see the waste taking place by the government. I mean, most of this money is wasted and there is no way that you efficient government is the biggest oxymoron around. You know, well, government, no government, can, government can never be efficient because nobody is if nobody is efficient with somebody else's money. It's just it, that's impossible. You're not you're not going to you're going to be extravagant. I mean, who washes a rental car? Right. You don't you don't go and change the oil. Right. It, it's not your car. Well, you don't give you don't care uh, about it. So, you know, the government um, doesn't care about spending other people's money. In fact, they want to spend as much of other people's money as they possibly can. You know, they, they're incentivized to be extra extravagant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. Like you say, nobody uh, washes a rental car. Nobody's changing the oil. And uh, <laughs> you're lucky if it gets returned with four tires on it. Yeah, <laughs> especially, especially if it's a, if it's a, if it's a manual. I mean, yeah. imagine what happens to the clutch. I mean, people like, you know. No, that's why they've gotten rid of them. It's too hard for the millennials to figure out how to uh, how to run a standard transmission. They just doesn't work. <laughs> Push a button. Hey, so uh, looking at uh, what's happening with AI, all right, do you have any uh, insights, anything you see personally in the financial industry? Is it really a cause for concern or are we just worrying about nothing here? Well, look, I don't think innovation progress is ever a cause for concern. Now, can individuals be concerned about how it may impact them in the short run? Sure. I mean, you can look at uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, maybe in the financial services industry, you can say, well, you know, we could replace financial advisors, you know, with uh, just computers. And, you know, for the type of advice that you get from most financial advisors, you're not going to notice the difference because <laughs> it's all it's all robotic anyway. Um, but, you know, the, the computers only know what they've been programmed to know. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't feel threatened that somebody's going to replace me with a, with a uh, AI, but maybe I'll be able to replace some of my employees uh, with artificial <laughs> intelligence. But but that will just make my business more efficient, and I'll be able to uh, pass that on uh, to other people, my customers, and you know with mm -hmm. a lower lower fees. But you know whenever you have an advancement, to the extent that we can create uh, a computer program that can do a lot of mundane tasks, let's say programming, let's say we can have computers that are intelligent enough to write code for, for programs, and now we don't need all these coders. Okay, well, you know, that frees up all these smart people who have been spending their time coding. Now they can do something else with their intelligence that the computer can't do, okay? Uh, you know, it, it, it goes back to the beginning of, you know, of machines. You know, people were always afraid, oh, you're going to put people out of work, right? Uh, somebody, in, you know, invented a bulldozer. Right. And, oh, you're going to put out of work a lot of people who were digging with shovels. Well, that's true. But shovels put out a lot of people who were digging by hand, 
you know, the shovel was a big improvement. Should they have never had the shovel because it destroyed jobs? You didn't need as many people to dig? No. And then they shouldn't destroy the, the bulldozers and all these other earth moving equipment that made labor more productive. So all of this artificial intelligence is going to make humans more productive. I think the, the, the absolute goal of humanity will be a society where machines do everything. And we don't have to do anything if we don't want to, right? Where you just live a life of leisure or you pursue things that are ratifying, mentally stimulating, physically stimulating, you know, things that you want to do. But all the, the mundane tasks uh, could be done uh, by, by computers, by, by machines. You know, why should we have to do these things if, you know, we can invent a machine that's going to do it because they're not going to get bored. They don't care how many times they have to repeat a task. No coffee breaks. <laughs> it's like they don't, they don't matter. Right. And of course, you know, you, they're not going to sue you. They, you know, you can't sexually harass them or discriminate against them. You could you know, try. Right? I mean, they're just going <laughs> to, they're going to do what needs to be done and they're not going to complain. Hey, totally agree. Your take Elon Musk. All right. Let's put the subsidies aside. Everybody's subsidized in this world today. If we weren't subsidized, you know, everything would be better. What is your take on him as far as who he is? Twitter, uh, Tesla Motors, SpaceX. Is he yeah. friend or foe? Well, look, he's obviously a extremely intelligent guy, uh, very eccentric. Um, and look, you know, um, you got to admire all of the accomplishments that he's had. I mean, especially even at the age that he is, he's he's accomplished a tremendous amount. Um, you know, was buying Twitter a, a good financial move? I, I don't think so. I, I didn't think so from the beginning, which is one of the reasons I thought that he was just bluffing. I thought he was smart enough to know. But I think, you know, and, I, and he mentioned this himself, when you get to the point where you're the richest man of the world, at least he was uh, uh, momentarily <laughs> because of the overpriced uh, Tesla stock that, that, he, that he owned. Uh, but you do a lot of things, even if money is not the issue. And I don't know that money was the motivating factor behind Twitter. And, uh, and, and so he spent some of his money in order to uh, own Twitter. And hopefully he can turn it around and, and, and cause it to stop losing money so that it can be a, a sustainable business, even if it's not worth what he paid. Although, of course, you know, he sold a lot of overpriced Tesla stock to raise the money. So, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other, you know, he's probably it's all funny money as far as he's concerned. And, you know, he's he's got enough money that if Twitter goes to zero, it's not going to impact his standard of living uh, at cares. all. Right. Uh, so yeah. he you know, he can certainly afford uh, to do that. But, you know, uh, he, I, he, look, he's a bright guy. I mean, a lot of times I, I think that he's joking about things. You know, I think he's got an interesting sense of humor, especially when it comes to the cryptocurrency space. I think a lot of people want to take him seriously, but uh, I think I, I, I get the jokes that he's telling and, and the, the points he's trying to make subtly, though, but he's making them. Um, but, you know, I think that color. I think that we probably if he and I sat down and had a conversation, I think we would agree on far more than we disagree. I think that I think that the Elon Musk sees uh, the world in many in many ways uh, through a similar uh, prism. I mean, I did have an opportunity to have a long conversation with his mother one day. She was out here in Puerto Rico, and I, I met her, you know, uh, at one of the restaurants by the pool. A lovely, lovely woman, and um, yeah, I mean, maybe one of these days I'll be able to uh, have a conversation with uh, with Musk as with as well. I'd like to be a fly on the wall for that. Um, yeah, I don't think the guy could care less about money. <clears throat> he, besides a private jet, he doesn't seem to have a lot of the accoutrements of wealth. Well, I'm sure he cares money. about money, and you know, you know, and, and I, I, I don't think that he was sheerly motivated by altruism. You know, <laughs> the way the way uh, Bankman Freed pretended to be, yeah, um, but. But, you know, once you have a certain amount of money, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's not as important, I guess. You know, I, I don't think I'm at that point where I have so much money that more isn't 
is it meaningful? Now, small amounts are not as meaningful, but you know, a billion dollars to me would be a meaningful sum. And but it's it's probably immaterial to to Elon whether he had an extra billion or not, uh, because you know there's only so many submarines that you can put on your yacht, right? If that's what you want, I mean, you're going to run out of stuff to buy. Yeah, and he could go up and down in his net worth ten billion in a day, and nothing has changed. So, but I, I do find it interesting, like SpaceX, he's doing all these things in the private sector that NASA forgot how to do. And the concept of reusable boosters and making space affordable, and then Starlink with all the internet service all over the world, global. Yeah, well, I've got I've got Starlink. One of them, I have several internet sources here in Puerto Rico just to have backups for my backups. But one of them is Starlink, and Starlink worked really well for me uh, when we had power for no week. A week we had no power at all. I was on generator, but we didn't. You know, some of my other internets were down. Uh, Starlink uh, worked really well. But yeah, I mean, I would much rather have the private sector in space, you know, whether it's Jeff Bezos or, or Musk, than NASA. I mean, you know, because NASA is not going to approach it on a cost benefit uh, analysis because it's not their money. They don't give a damn how much it costs to send somebody to the moon. But uh, if Elon Musk is going to be doing something or Jeff Bezos, they're looking at the commercial uh, value and they're either investing their own money or investors are putting the money up, but they're putting the money up because they believe they can get a return. Because if the government does something and they don't care what it costs, they're willing to waste money, that's a net loss for society because resources are being used on a space program that could have been used someplace else. There's not an unlimited amount of resources. And so whatever we divert, devote to a space program is at the expense of something else. And so if it's not going to uh, you know, put out more than it, it, than it consumes in, in terms of resources, then we're poor as a result of having spent the money. But to the extent that Elon Musk can find a way to do something in space that generates a positive return then those resources weren't wasted. We actually have something to show for the expenditure of those resources. But you're never gonna get that type of positive risk reward analysis coming from a government. That's why you want to limit to the greatest degree possible what government does. And you want to allow the private sector to do as much as possible. And that includes, you know, infrastructure. You had Biden last night talking about how we want the government to spend more on infrastructure. No, I don't. They'll waste money. They'll build the proverbial bridge to nowhere. Only a politician would build a bridge to nowhere. No private citizen is going to waste money building a bridge to nowhere. How's he going to make any money off that bridge? Who's going to pay to use it? So, you know, it's not like we won't have infrastructure if the government doesn't provide it. In fact, a lot of the infrastructure, look at the New York subway system. That was bought, that was uh, built by the private sector. The government just took it over. They didn't build it. So we would have plenty of infrastructure if the government stayed out of infrastructure. We would have better infrastructure. It would be uh, you know, more economically viable. And, uh, and better built and better placed. Hey, so the space program under NASA compared to Tesla is similar to the person washing the rental car before they return it. NASA just shoots stuff up into space. And aside from the astronauts they don't really care if it comes back or not musk on the other hand sees that uh, that hey this is costing me money to produce junk to float around space if i bring it back to earth i can use it again and it's the yes. perfect example right <laughs> of, of course you know so if there is a a purpose for being in outer space uh then the free market will take advantage of it you know and at least if there's not a purpose, you know, they can't make any money, they'll, they'll stop going up there. Now, of course, you know, at some point in time, space will be a lot more economical, uh, you know, to, to, to exploit because we'll have better technology. And, you know, at, uh, humans at some point, I'm sure, will be spacefaring uh, civilization. There will be an economical way to get up there. Uh, there may be valuable resources that we can harvest uh, from asteroids or other planets. We may, in fact, need other planets, you know, in a hundred million years or maybe a lot sooner than that 
especially if these climate change people are 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 are, are right. But you know, maybe we'll need uh, you know more planets, and you know, and but by the time we need them, hopefully, you know, I guess mankind will be able to get there. I mean, you and I aren't going to know about it, you know, yeah, but be. but uh, you know, but I mean, at some point. Yeah, I don't, you know, we'll, we'll be, they'll be able to use, yeah, use space. But, um, you know, so far, it doesn't seem that we've encountered anybody from any other solar system who's uh, been able to, to get here. So it seems that it's not that easy to do or we're very rare in the, uh, in the galaxy. Or they're hiding it on us. Hey. <laughs> Although may, maybe those distances are just too, too vast. You know, for, you know, I don't know if any, maybe no one's figured out how to, how to travel those types of distances yet. If, if they have, uh, the government's hiding it from us anyway, and that I don't even want to go down they, that They're, they're not all. smart enough to hide it from us, you know? <laughs> what about Roswell? You give, you give them too much credit if you think that there's UFOs or the government is hiding it. It's like... Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Hey, uh, so I'm just going to read you what the uh, chat uh, open AI said about you, and you're going to laugh at the end. Oh, what did you, what did you ask it? <laughs> I just said, Peter Schiff, Euro-Pacific, and that's it. So it said, Peter Schiff is an American financial analyst and commentator. He is the chief economist and strategist at Euro Pacific Capital, a full service investment firm that provides a range of financial products and services. Schiff is known for his bearish views on the U.S. economy and his advocacy of international investing, particularly in precious metals and foreign currencies. It's important to note that individual investment advice can vary widely and past performance is not indicative of future <laughs> results. But listen, before making any investment decisions, it's always a good idea to do your own research and consult with a financial advisor. <laughs> they have that every financial person I put in there. Those last but it's not even minutes. giving advice. Why is it even? As, I guess they're afraid of getting sued somehow. So they're putting <laughs> disclaimers everywhere. But, you know, I, the one thing about it is because, yeah, it's it only has data up to a certain point. And I've changed my affiliation. So it doesn't know that because now you can see that I'm now the um, uh, chief strategist for Euro Pacific Asset Management rather than Euro Pacific Capital. So but I made that change after they shut down the, the data into the, into that program because it's not <laughs> you know, it's not getting any any new information. Oh, I didn't know. That. Um, oh, now we know why. It, but the interesting thing is ask it like I, I would, you know, I haven't gone on it yet, but I got to ask it like, you know, who's the who's the uh, ask it? Who's the most famous gold bug or who's the biggest critic of crypto? And I wonder if it picks me That's like like because, cool. you know, what, to ask it to uh, to use its um, reasoning its judgment. Yeah. But my, my son does a lot of funny things. He sent me some of the stuff he's done because he he asks that the, the program to uh, you know, concoct a hypothetical conversation between me and somebody else. And he picks the people and it's very funny, you know, or, or write a short story or, you know, a couple, an essay, you know, how, how, how would Peter Schiff interact with, and it, it's funny because it, it, the, the programming learns a little bit about me quickly, learns about the other person, and then has to come up with a, a way that we might interact with one another and wh what we might say to each other. All but right. then he'll say, uh -huh. and, but then, my, then he'll say, but but uh, imagine, but Peter Schiff is drunk. He's had a lot to drink, or this guy, you know. It's just like, and then they can yeah. throw in those variables. Oh, that's great. So listen <laughs> to this. It just did it. It's difficult to determine who the most famous gold bug is, as the term is often used to describe individuals who hold a strong belief in the value of gold as a form of investment and hedge against economic uncertainty. Some well-known individuals who are associated with this philosophy include. Peter Schiff. Oh, so I'm number one. Mark Faber. Yeah. <laughs> However, it's important to note that investment <laughs> strategies and opinions can vary widely and past performance is not indicative of future results. Before making any investment decisions, it's always a good idea to do your own research. Yeah, you read that already. Right? Financial that's, that's, advisor. I haven't, I haven't, I didn't even notice that because I haven't spent any time doing that. But yeah, because people often ask me, who do you think the biggest, you know, gold, gold guy is? And I think it's me. I mean, I think, you know, You're up there. I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't at the beginning because I remember who the top goal guys were when I was younger. But now those guys have gotten old. Maybe some of them have some of them have passed away. There. And so now I'm, I'm still around. But, you know, I think one of the reasons that I'm so well known now for gold actually is because of crypto, because all these crypto people now know about me as the, as the gold bug that doesn't like crypto. 
So they, you know, the, I'm just the old fashioned, you know, mm -hmm. grandpa holding on to my horse and buggy. So I, I'm probably the only gold person they know because they know me right. because because I'm anti crypto and 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 they know me from that, you know. <laughs> Anti, I call them cryptocurrencies. But gold, I mean, because gold, I mean, gold is, a, I mean, I like gold. I'm an advocate of the gold standard. I believe in sound money. I believe people should have gold. But my primary business is not gold. It's, it's asset management. Gold represents an allocation within my overall strategy. But, you know, I, I, you know it's, it's not really part of my asset management business. I tell people to buy gold. I help them buy gold. Although in my strategies and in my funds we do have investments in gold related equities gold mining companies silver mining companies so in that respect i've introduced an element of gold into my strategy because i think there's a lot of value in these stocks but still that sector is a minority of my portfolios right i mean my portfolios other than my gold fund, I have a strategy that's 100% gold, right? For people who want to have that in their portfolio, I do have strategies that are all gold. But in my strategies that are broader and just try to create a, 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 a diversified portfolio of assets, they will have an allocation to gold stocks, whether that's 10% or 15%, you know, might depend on, you know, the, right. the stocks themselves. But my core, stra my core strategies my value and dividend payer strategies, they both have uh, allocations to gold. And the, the allocations could vary from time to time. In fact, if gold stocks ever got really expensive, they, they would have no gold stocks in them. Uh, but you know, since I've been managing these funds, these strategies, I've never really you know, come into contact where a point where I thought gold stocks were really expensive, even though they have had some pretty big drops. Uh, I didn't think they were very expensive. You know. Um, yeah. They weren't cheap. There were times I didn't think they were cheap. Although now, I still think they're 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 very cheap. Not only in relation to gold, but in relation to you know their own historic prices and a lot of the other other metrics. But you know, by the way, too, last year those my two core strategies delivered positive returns, which was rare for 2022. I mean, we had a bear market, one of the worst years ever for stocks and bonds. And my two core strategies that were 100% long stocks had positive returns. They weren't big numbers. Uh, now, they would have been much bigger numbers, but for the strength of the dollar. I mean, the dollar weakened in the fourth quarter, but it was still up you know, about 10% on the year. And when all of my stocks are foreign, that means I have to go up 10% to break even because I have to overcome the dollar strength. But, you know, the core belief of my strategy and what I'm, I'm, I'm basing it on is that I think the dollar is going to go way down. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but when it does happen, and I believe it will happen, and maybe this year will be uh, the beginning of it, this could be the worst year ever for the dollar, we'll see, or one of the worst years. Uh, but then that's going to be a huge tailwind for my strategy. So my strategies did very well uh, in an up market for the dollar, but I think they'll do much, much better, certainly in an, on an absolute basis. Not last year was great relative return, not necessarily absolute return, uh, but on a relative basis. In fact, um, uh, US News and World Report, they looked at 350 large cap uh, international value funds. They didn't even realize there was you know, that many of them, 350, so it's a big sample. And then they ranked the top 60. And I got number one and I got number three. So somehow Goldman Impressive. Sachs managed to edge me out for number two. Mm -hmm. I, I, hopefully I'll beat them this year and I'll be number one and number two. All right. Well, we'll see. Hey, but past performance is no guarantee of future yeah. results. So. Well, I was going to mention that because <laughs> you didn't break the top three on uh, crypto or cryptocurrencies. The top three were Warren Buffett, Jamie Dimon and Nouriel Rabini. So maybe oh, I'm, not, I'm not in the top three critics of crypto. Oh, no, you're not. I can't believe I'm way bigger than Nuriel. Yeah, well, you sure. think you think, but ask it course. to name the top five. Let's see if I can see if it All gets right, me we in there. We could do that. We'll just do one more. Uh, <laughs> top five crypto. I can't believe I won this award for the word. I remember from some. Yeah, well, she's just not up. Uh, doesn't like it. Nah, I can't run it. I've run too many searches. Uh, but um, I mean, Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon, I mean, those are big, those are well-known yeah. critics of crypto 
among people who don't own crypto. So let's say you ask somebody who's never heard of Bitcoin or, you know, <laughs> I don't know, they've never bought it. Maybe they've heard of it, but they, they're, not, they're not in the game. They might mention Jamie Dimon or a Warren Buffett. But I think if you went to like a hardcore crypto guy that own, you know, owns it and you asked him for the top critic, that, that guy or gal would say me. Yeah. <laughs> they... Oh, here we go. So it changed its mind here. And I'm sorry, you're still not in the top 10. Oh, listen. I'm not in the top 10? No, Warren Buffett, <laughs> Charlie Munger is now number two, uh -huh. Jamie Dimon, Nouriel Rabini, they just like him in there, Paul Krugman, Joseph Stiglitz, Mohammed El Arian, uh, Bill Gates, Alan Greenspan, and Robert Schiller. <laughs> yes, well, they're, they're, they're anti Bitcoin, right? But I, I don't think they're as, as, as much anti as I am. Probably but not. I think the, the, the main difference is though, I'm the only one really of those, the group, that's both a gold bug and anti-crypto. Well, all right. So we'll, we'll keep Jamie going. Because Jamie Dobbin doesn't like gold either, right? You know, the, you know, a lot of these guys are negative on gold too. Yeah, we'll have to refine it and we'll put it up in the show notes. <laughs> well, I'm just, I, I, that just takes, you know, I, I, I think it's wrong there. So I don't, I don't know, I don't right. know how it's programming is uh, missing me. Let me see if we can appeal the decision of the chat <laughs> box, okay? Maybe there is a, uh, uh, an AI tribunal where you get to dispute the results, kind of like <laughs> uh, appealing a strike from. But it uh, knows I don't like media. crypto based on the things my son have done. I mean, it knows I'm anti Bitcoin or anti crypto, so it knows yeah. that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, we got to go. But at least, at least I'm number one for gold. So I can, I guess that shows you how few people out there are advocating gold because I'm like, that's like all, I'm all I can come up with. Oh, man. Hey, well, we got to get going now. But Peter, where is the best place to find your work these days and your podcast and all your uh, work? Well, you know, I do my podcast um, usually a couple of times a week at, at uh, you know, Shift Radio. So you can listen at Shift Radio. You can go to my YouTube channel, Peter Schiff Show. I've um, got a little over, what, 520,000 subscribers to the YouTube channel now. And I got a couple hundred thousand regular podcast listeners on all the platforms. So some people listen on YouTube. Some people listen on Shift Radio. Some people listen you know, on iTunes or uh, mm -hmm. various other platforms where you can find podcasts. But I would suggest listening to them. Uh, telling your friends about them. You know, there's a lot of misinformation out there in the mainstream media. And so I think it's important for uh, people to look for alternative sources like, you know, what you're doing with your, with your podcast, what I'm doing. So uh, get more people to, uh, to, to listen. I think I do a really good job of explaining things in a way that people can understand it um, and, then, and then explain it to other people. Um, follow me on social media. You know, I'm on all of the various platforms, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok. But I think Twitter is where I spend the most amount of time personally. Um, almost all the tweets are my own. I mean, sometimes, you know, Shift Gold puts out some tweets out there. But pretty much I do my own tweeting. I, I put some thought into the tweets and what I want to comment about. And, you know, I've got, you know, almost 920,000 followers. So, uh, and there's a lot of engagement. I mean, I noticed this about my Twitter page. When you look at a tweet that I do and you look at the engagement, look at the, the, the comments, you look at the likes or the retweets, there are people that have millions of followers, you know, many more than I do, sure. that don't get anywhere near that kind of engagement. You know, they'll put out Thank a tweet you. and, you know, barely anybody notices it. So I think the people that follow me are pretty active on, on Twitter, not just to comment to me, but commenting with one another. I mean, I look at, you know, somebody makes a comment and people comment on their comment. Uh, so there's a lot of engagement there. So, um, yeah, so follow me on, on, uh, on, on Twitter. And, uh, but most importantly, if you've got the resources, become a client. You know, uh, I think the last year was, was a good year. I mean, a great year on a relative basis. In fact, we caught up uh, to a lot of our competitors. You know, if you look at some of my funds a couple of years ago, they were at the bottom of the pack. They had one star, now five stars. You know, I've gone, I've made up a lot of ground because I stuck to the, the, the fundamentals. I didn't chase momentum. I didn't just try 
to mimic an index and just try to make a little bit more than everybody else or lose a little bit less than everybody else. And I still think that most people, most professional managers are completely misallocated uh, with their strategies. They, the, the benchmarks are going to be a disaster. And so the people whose main goal is not to deviate from the benchmark, they're gonna succeed in that goal, but they're gonna fail in the goal that's most important, which is protecting the, the purchasing power of their, of their clients. And it's purchasing power that you need to protect because some managers could do a good job of protecting your principal, meaning that they don't lose money for you because they decide not to take any risk, but they end up taking the ultimate risk and that is inflation. You know, because you could put a lot of money in cash and not lose any of your precious dollars, but wake up one morning and those dollars don't buy you very much because the people that have the stuff that you want to buy don't want your dollars anymore. Uh, and, and so I'm always looking at that risk uh, in a portfolio, the risk of inflation, the decline of the dollar. And so for that reason, we're generally, you know, not 100 percent invested. I mean, we always keep a little bit of cash, some dry powder, uh, but, you know, 90 percent plus of the money that I have under management is pretty much always invested. You know, and, and even though we were 100 percent invested last year, you know, in our, our core strategies, we still we still had a positive return. Some of my strategies, my, my goal fund, uh, my emerging market fund had losses, uh, but not that substantial. And most of those losses have already been recovered, but right? they might have all been recovered already in 20 uh, in 2023. Uh, but I think over the long term, uh, I think we're, we're, we're still big, you know, well positioned for the big move because the dollar is still higher than it was, you know, 10 years ago. The dollar has a long way to fall. And I think when it really starts to fall, it's going to happen quick. And so you've got to be prepared. You've got to be protected from uh, that inflation tax that's going to eviscerate, I think, the vast majority of people's portfolios, uh, but not mine. I mean, I think I, you know, I've been preparing for this for a long time. And the pendulum is now swinging in my direction. I think uh, the, the problems that I saw years ago, even before the 08 financial crisis, uh, we're now starting to see uh, the consequences, although most people still don't recognize what they see because they still don't understand the nature of the problem. Just like so many people were surprised by the 2008 financial crisis, it was because they didn't understand the problem. I wasn't surprised. I expected it because I understood what was going wrong. And that's why so many people uh, believe that Fed policy was a success in the aftermath of 08. It wasn't a success. It was an abysmal failure. I know that because I understood the nature of the problem. They didn't solve anything. They made the problem worse. They just covered it with a Band-Aid of inflation. Uh, but now inflation has become such a problem uh, that you know, we're now at the end of our rope. And I, I think, again, eventually the Fed is going to pivot. They are going to try to stimulate, again, the economy by creating more inflation because that's the only economic tool they have is inflation. Yeah. You know, quantitative easing is just inflation. They just gave it a nicer name so that people wouldn't oppose it. But we're going to go back to that. But it's not going to work again. Not that it ever worked, but it's not going to make us high like it did before. We're just going to over overdose on it. And inflation is going to go through the roof, you know, at least, you know, as measured by uh, the, the CPI and PPI and those in those indexes. OK. All right. Well, if you got a question for Peter, shoot us an email, kl at kerryletz.com. Make sure you sign up for your free newsletter on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. We got a link to Peter's site there. Peter, always a pleasure. Good luck for the coming year, and we'll see what happens later on. All right, take care.